any fortification can be taken if the enemy is willing and able to pay the cost. The objective of fortification is to increase that cost to the level that the enemy is unable to pay. And that's what the French were trying to do with the Maginot Line, to build a strong fortification that would discourage the Germans from attacking and making it hard for them to attack. Hidden among the groves and hillsides of eastern France lies what remains of the greatest defensive barrier constructed since the Great Wall of China. Built by the French between the First and Second World Wars, the Maginot Line fulfilled the goals of its creators, and yet the French suffered a crushing defeat within weeks of open conflict with their enemies, the Germans. The line survives largely in ruins, and yet it barely saw any direct assault on its defenses. For over half a century, historians have debated, was the Maginot Line a horrendous failure or a thorough success? Today the line has drifted into oblivion, called by some the greatest white elephant of the century, converted into a mushroom farm here or a museum there. Almost everything uh, has been broken or stolen, so very few are still in a good state of conservation. This is the case of uh, Imerov, uh, where uh, almost all the equipments are in working order. Some uh, were bought by uh, communities like this one, well, to, to open it to public. Some were sold to uh, individual people, and uh, they just sold all the steel. This is a far cry from the line's purpose, conceived as a direct response to the devastation wreaked upon France at the close of the First World War. It became equal parts technology, desperation, and myth. But it began as a limited series of defensive fortifications in Alsace-Lorraine, near the German border, built to forestall a German invasion. It soon grew, at least in the minds of some, into an impregnable barrier over 500 miles long, extending from one end of France to the other. The Maginot Line consisted of reinforced subterranean concrete fortifications linked by firepower with large underground galleries some containing railroads that carried ammunition and troops, plus sophisticated, powerful weapons and communication centers, all designed to conserve manpower and keep Germany out of France. The Maginot Line was born out of the horrors of World War I, a war that was supposed to end all wars. World War I was different than any war in history. It was a war characterized by technology and a war that was fought on several dimensions. It was fought in the air, under the sea, on the land, and under the land. And new weapons were developed and used, such as the tank. When Germany surrendered on November 11th, 1918, much of Europe was in tatters. But France had been the stage upon which most of the war had been played out. Its victory was one from which it barely recovered. At this point, we're tired. We are tired, tired, tired. And here we have a treaty that gives us a breathing space. There's no real immediate worry. The treaty was the Treaty of Versailles, which attempted to settle the disagreements between the opposing sides of World War I and ensured that Germany could never again threaten its neighbors. Though the treaty was intended to resolve the First World War, some argue that it may have guaranteed a second. The Versailles Treaty was a disaster for Germany and turned out to be a disaster for everybody else. It hinged on Article 231 where Germany had to sign that it started the war and was responsible for it and had to pay for all the damages. The monetary damages were 33 billion in addition to the reparations Germany had to pay, it lost 15% of its land, including some to Poland and Belgium. It had to give up Alsace-Lorraine, captured from France in 1870. Germany's armed forces were partly dismantled and reduced to 100,000 men. The Rhineland, a springboard for previous German invasions of Western Europe, was occupied by the Allies and was to be demilitarized. Germany had a Versailles complex. If anything united Germany, from the communists to the extreme right and the monarchists, 
it was that Versailles was unfair. And Hitler could rise on this Versailles complex. His message was, I will lead you out of Versailles. I will lead you out of the shame of Versailles. I think the Treaty of Versailles has been made a scapegoat. What would the Germans have done if they had won? After Woodrow Wilson helped draft the treaty, the United States Congress hedged. The U.S. didn't ratify the Versailles Treaty. They didn't give the guarantee of the Rhineland Agreement that, that Wilson had promised, so that the French certainly had reason to feel let down on that score. In 1918, the British had sounded as strenuous as the French about reparations, about getting the Germans to pay, about being solid with their former ally. Within the space of a year or so, the British changed their tune. They felt va vastly disappointed that the British could not see that the French had real security problems. With the Channel and the Atlantic between them, France began to feel abandoned by its allies, and a sense of dread tinged their exhaustion. The problem that France has always had is that it has believed in its own intrinsic glory, thinking back to the days of Louis XIV and, and Napoleon. But if a nation does not have the morale and the will to defend itself, then you can't blame the Allies. Demographics played a huge role in, in uh, subsequent French defense preparations. Uh, the French realized they didn't have the manpower to actually launch offensives against Germany. So there's this sort of this, this psychological mood in France um, that even though f the French were the victors, they don't feel like the victors. With their alliances faltering, France was no longer the world power it had been. And there was a decidedly pacifist attitude throughout the country in response to the devastation it had suffered. Yet France recognized the very real threat a vengeful Germany might pose. Whatever solution France came up with, it had to involve more than just soldiers. For France in the 1920s, the first step in any attempt to thwart a possible resurgent Germany was to defend those areas most vulnerable to attack. The Alsace and Lorraine regions in northeastern France near the Rhineland were the most obvious choice, with compulsory military service in France now shrunk to one year, plus the loss of men from the recent war. Permanent battalions of soldiers did not exist to stand guard. The French contemplated a barrier of some kind. Throughout the countryside, Medieval towns and villages are surrounded by walls designed to keep attackers out and villagers safely in. But fortifications have their drawbacks too. One of the problems with any sort of extensive system of fortifications is you have to defend them all and you have to defend them all equally. Otherwise your attacker is going to go through your weak spot. So this means you have to spread out your defenders. And this gives somewhat of an advantage to the attacker because it allows the attacker to uh, attack you, concentrate his strength while you have your strength spread out. France also looked to the harsh lessons of the Great War, when it had become apparent that a swift victory after a few limited battles would not be forthcoming. The belligerence of the First World War dug in, creating what amounted to a series of long ditches, or trenches, from the English Channel to the Swiss frontier. This was a totally new concept, trench warfare, and the war became stationary uh, for the duration of the four years. Neither side could have a breakthrough, and it became a war of attrition and a piece of exhaustion. Trench warfare became a cornerstone in French plans for their future defense. The logic being that the trenches had held, which in actual fact they didn't, as we all know, that the French liked to believe that flimsy trenches, which were cheap, and bits of barbed wire and lots of machine guns, you know, would keep the country safe. Uh, whereas others proposed um, a limited number of fortifications. Um, of course, they were busily ignoring advances in aviation, in artillery. <laughs> 
but then it's a well-known saying that generals always fight the last war. The French knew that ultimately the Rhineland would be reoccupied by Germany if the Allies removed themselves from this buffer zone. If the Germans reoccupied the Rhineland, France would be vulnerable. At least along its borders with Switzerland and Italy, the Alps were a formidable barrier. In the north, Belgium was an ally, and in the east, the Rhine River and Vosges Mountains provided some protection. But the Rhineland was perceived as an open door, and the French endeavored to close it by undertaking a massive program of fortification construction along the Franco-German border. In the 1920s, when they went made the decision to go ahead and build a system of fortifications, the war minister set up several commissions. And about 1927, they set up something known as the CORF, which in English refers to a commission for the organization of fortified fronts. And what the CORF did was prepare the designs that were going to be used on all the fortifications. Korf drew up the plans in the late 1920s, but the push to fund the construction of the defenses began with Paul Panlevé, who was then Minister of War. Panlevé was succeeded by a former war hero named André Maginot. But Maginot had nothing to do with the design of the barrier. But where his real work lay was in actually getting the money, the first main slice of money. He used all his influence uh, to push it through. Maginot was a consummate politician. He would appeal to the right and he would appeal to French patriotism and, and France as a country full of um, national pride and grandeur is, is the word, um, that, that France is a world power and must remain so. And then he would turn to the left and say, hey, this is going to be a great a great way to solve our unemployment problem, right? We'll be able to, we'll be able to put a lot of people to work on this Maginot line. So he would appeal to both the left and the right. Shortly after having initially secured nearly three million francs for the defenses, tall, solitary André Maginot died. He actually was at a New Year's banquet and um, got food poisoning because of uh, oysters that he had eaten, and so he ended up dying. So that ended his, his tenure as uh, Minister of War. But that period between 1929 and 1932 was really critical because he was the one who, who suggested that there was, some, there was a sense of urgency. Three years later, a newspaper referred to the eastern defenses as the Maginot Line, and the name stuck. André Maginot had come from Alsace, so it was not surprising that he supported the construction of the barrier to defend that region. But André Maginot died thinking the barrier would be one thing. After his death, it would become something much different, at least in the minds of the French. Corf began construction in 1929, after the funds had been raised. The whole objective of the Maginot Line was to delay a German attack into France. Not to stop the Germans from attacking, but to make it very difficult for the Germans to attack. And to be able to use this defensive position as something behind which they could mobilize a field army and uh, defend themselves and be prepared to launch counterattacks. Counter so basically, was intended to offset the population difference uh, between France and Germany. But the purpose of the line would slowly shift. As the decade moved on and as the pressure for reducing military service increased and when it became clear that one, the Rhineland was going to be evacuated and probably ahead of schedule, two, the army was going to be reduced, the length of military service would be reduced to one year, the function of the fortification shifted to being in effect a substitute for a reduced army and that's really the crucial question of how to think about the fortifications how to fit them into larger mil military plan as construction of the Maginot line continued the dark clouds of war began to gather unmistakably in the east As originally conceived, the Maginot Line was a first line of defense, allowing a relatively small group of soldiers to forestall the enemy, while larger forces mobilized behind the front. With this in mind, the French military drew up plans for the line and construction officially began in 1929. 
The Maginot Line would consist of a series of large and small defensive positions linked together and specifically designed to make use of the natural landscape. Built by local contractors, construction was coordinated by Corp through the War Ministry and continued throughout the early 1930s. Ultimately, the Maginot Line contained about one and a half million cubic meters of concrete, nearly enough to fill California's Rose Bowl twice. 150,000 tons of steel and 450 kilometers of roads and railways. It's made up of a series of defensive positions connected together by anti-tank obstacles and by barbed wire. And there are defensive positions that fire along these lines so that if any attacker tries to come through them, they're going to be taken in the flank uh, and be, be under fire continuously from wherever they go. Periodically, the, this line is strengthened by stronger works called ouvrages, which is literally work in French. The basic components of the ouvrages were massive concrete combat blocks sunk low into the ground so that they were concealed from view as much as possible. The roofs of these were in some cases up to 10 and 12 feet thick of reinforced concrete. Each one had its own type of armament normally. That might be a uh, 75 millimeter gun turret, it might be a 135 millimeter howitzer turret, it might be an 81 millimeter mortar turret, or it might be what was called a casemate block and these were instead of guns being in turrets were guns mounted firing through embrasures in the wall of the block one of the basic principles of the Maginot line was that exposure to the front was very limited guns in casemate blocks did not fire forward but rather along the flanks of the line in order to support adjacent works ouvrages came in two sizes petite and gross Gross or large ouvrages had combat blocks that were armed with both infantry weapons, such as machine guns and anti-tank guns, and with artillery pieces. The combat blocks of Petite, or small ouvrages, were armed only with infantry weapons. There were ultimately about two dozen Gross ouvrages and three dozen Petite ouvrages in the line. Deep beneath each ouvrage, deep enough to resist enemy bombs and bombardment was a network of tunnels and galleries that connected the blocks together and contained the Uvraj's support facilities. These facilities were decentralized to prevent catastrophic damage from a single direct hit. The layout of the galleries in the, in the gross overages was basically tree-like. Uh, in that you've got a root system which is near the entrance block anywhere from up to a half mile to the rear of the main work. Underground galleries containing barracks accommodations, a power plant capable of sustaining the ouvrage, and the main ammunition supply were located near these blocks. And then running from the roots to the crown of the tree where the combat blocks were was one long gallery and through this gallery there was a train called the Metro after the Paris uh, underground system uh, and this is what a lot of people have heard about there really was a train it was electric powered uh, and it was used primarily to haul ammunition the troops mostly had to walk the combat blocks each had smaller underground galleries connected to the main gallery these galleries included secondary magazines small rest areas for troops elevator shafts that lifted ammunition and supplies to the combat blocks. The normal garrison area for the troops was in the rear area. The, the troops were triple bunked in most cases. The bunks were crammed in. There was also kitchens, facilities. Uh, each fort had its own uh, water supply, uh, latrines, hospital. Everything it needed to be self-sufficient for a month or more. Combat blocks were usually two-story structures with weapons mounted on the upper level and ammunition and air filtration equipment on the lower level. Here is located the machinery which can raise air pressure to keep out poison gas. Air inside the works was kept at a higher pressure than air outside so that gas could not come in through openings. Large filtration systems were designed to filter out any poison gas. Unfortunately, the plumbing didn't work quite so well. Drainage proved a vexing problem as did the stench from clogged latrines. The overall dampness inside the line made it relatively unpleasant for those garrisoned there. 
they found they had some problems, like it was too damp in many of these overages. And basically, uh, what they ended up doing was putting in space heaters to warm up the place for the men, and it doesn't go away. It's always damp in those overages. Though radio communication was available, phones were more secure and reliable. All of the Maginot line works were connected together through an internal phone system that was also connected to the public phone system by telephone cables buried deep into the ground. Similarly, the works were hooked into France's main electricity grid, even though they were capable of generating their own power. This was a really high technology. Everything inside is electrical. And uh, you must imagine that at this time, in, in some country villages, there, were, there was even no electricity. And they had a heater, they had a, a flowing water, they had uh, toilets inside, and uh, <laughs> this is really luxury and uh, something uh, very modern for this time. Ammunition, equipment, and supplies were brought to the line by trucks or special 24-inch gauge military railroads. The same gauge as that used by trains inside the Gros Ouvrages. Diesel engines pulled small cars carrying ammunition and supplies into the munitions entrance blocks, where they were switched over and hauled by electric locomotives in the galleries. The forts contained large amounts of ammunition and provisions were made for supplying that rapidly to the combat blocks because the combat blocks, although they were small in number and didn't have many guns, they had very rapid firing guns and they could burn a lot of ammunition in a hurry. A main magazine near the entrance stored reserve supplies in very large crate-like containers. These crates could be transported by overhead monorail trolleys to the main gallery. To control its artillery fire, each Gros Ouvrage had an integral observation post. Additional observation posts were located at intervals along the line. Each observation post had photo murals that identified all visible landscape features. So the observers at these observation posts could get on the phone, call back to the command post, and say, the Germans are at the intersection of roads so and so and such and such and the people at the command post would know exactly where that was and they could allocate a combat block to fire on that attack so again even though there was a relatively small number of artillery pieces in the forts they could be very effective the line kept a low profile along the surface the exception was the fixed unretractable steel dome called a cloche which means bell in French over 1,500 were built, each large enough to hold one or two men. The cloches served many purposes, including observation and close-in defense. Sitting on the surface like giant steel mushrooms, cloches were made of very thick metal. They were very strong, armor up to 10 inches thick, but it turned out that that wasn't really quite thick enough because the Germans came up with the 88mm anti-aircraft gun, which... Uh, although it couldn't penetrate in most cases, could certainly do enough damage to give the, uh, the, the, the people inside a real headache. Although the reinforced concrete in the Maginot line was up to 12 feet thick, walls that made up the back of the line were much thinner, at 4 or 5 feet, or even less. But there was a good reason for this. And the reason this all comes about is because that's exactly the problem they had in World War I. At the Battle of Verdun, Fort Douaumont, the pride of the French forts, was taken by the Germans early in the campaign. And the French spent months trying to recapture their own fort because it was so well built. By the mid-30s, the bulk of the major work was completed and on time. Quarters for the men. State-of-the-art command posts. Spotless kitchens. Hospital rooms. And, of course, weaponry. The French tried to keep the line a secret. But this was difficult because local subcontractors were hired and many of the villages along the Maginot Line bounced back and forth between Germany and France every time the two countries signed an armistice. The people involved in the construction of the Maginot Line were 
yes, local enterprises, uh, civilian enterprises, and they had to uh, to hire many many uh, workers, including foreign workers, because uh, there was a lack of workers. As construction continued, the scope of the line was extended south along the Rhine River and west toward the English Channel. But the funding for the extensions was not on the scale that André Maginot had secured for the original Maginot line before his death, and was inadequate for the expanded system. Ironically, as the Germans began to learn more about the Maginot line, the French seemed to understand it less. After the Treaty of Versailles, the French hoped that a demilitarized Rhineland would act as a buffer to any German attack. The French, in fact, tried to create a Rhine Republic, a separate German state that was a satellite state to France, but America wouldn't go along with it in 1919. And so this was the compromise, the militarily occupied Rhineland. The Rhineland was to be occupied until 1936, giving France the breathing space it needed to recover from the war. But once again, France was disappointed by its allies. As it actually turned out, the Rhineland was evacuated five years ahead of schedule, in part because of the diplomatic negotiations that went on in mid-decade about other aspects of the Versailles Treaty. In 1936, as the initial construction effort on the Maginot Line was nearing completion, Hitler gave France a dress rehearsal for war. Hitler's first foreign policy move was to reoccupy the Rhineland with the new army that he was building. And some people have said if France at that point had sent troops, that might have stopped Hitler very early on and shown him his limitations. But France was without allies, nobody wanted to help France. It didn't have the will to fight, and so it just let it go. France reacted to the Rhineland crisis even before Hitler's reoccupation with a plan to extend the Maginot Line. Unsure of its allies and unable to muster a sizable army, the French began to see the Maginot Line and supporting works as their savior in any new conflict with Germany. A barrier they could hide behind. By the late 1930s, I think France was so much into this Maginot mentality and in a lot of ways even complacency that the, the French media had really played up the Maginot line and that the Maginot line was, was, was going to solve all problems that the Germans would never be able to get past the fortifications. Other events were taking place in the world of politics that would have an impact on the construction and usefulness of the Maginot line. France had always assumed Belgium would be its ally to the north, and thus hadn't extended the line to the English Channel. In fact, construction of the line had implicitly anticipated this partnership, allowing the French to concentrate their forces away from the Maginot Line and towards wherever an attack was most likely. Now, where did they want to concentrate them? They wanted to concentrate them on the northern frontier. And for a good long while, what they really would have liked is to concentrate them and to cooperate with the Belgians. So if there was a next war, it wouldn't be fought in France, it would be fought in Belgium. And after the Germans remilitarized the Rhineland in 1936, the Belgians backed out. Why should they cooperate with the French in using their territory as the main theater of operations. They were in a very, very difficult position. In 1936, Belgium declared its permanent neutrality, and suddenly France had a huge exposed flank all along its border with Belgium. There wasn't enough money or enough time to do anything about it, but the French tried anyway. They began something known as the New Fronts, and these New Fronts which uh, the English translated into an extension of the Maginot Line and they extended the Maginot Line at this point from the vicinity of Montmédy towards Ville. and this Maginot extension only had a few heavy fortifications in it and there was still a slight gap between Montmédy and Longueuil. They were built in the same basic style, the same basic technique, but they weren't nearly as strong. They had a lot less artillery, the works were farther apart, and it was definitely not up to the standard of the Maginot Line itself, or the Maginot Line proper. 
Beyond the dense Ardennes forest toward Dunkirk, the landscape posed insurmountable problems. The region is heavily industrialized along the border with Belgium. In addition, the land close to the coast has a high water table, making underground galleries infeasible. Finally, no natural barriers exist along this flat plain. France decided it would deploy soldiers along that border as a defense. At the same time that France began construction of the Maginot Line, it began an extensive program of fortification construction in the Alps along the border with Italy. The difficult landscape provided better defensive positions. Although these fortifications were not necessarily as dense as those in the Maginot Line proper, they were similarly built and their location often gave them a considerable advantage over an invading enemy. The combat blocks in the Alps will have casements that will actually, the artillery will face towards the direction of the enemy. And this is because there was no other way to do it. It was too expensive to put in turrets, and this was considered the most effective when building in the mountains. So many of these combat uh, casements will be reinforced so that they can uh, meet the enemy. The Little Maginot Line, as the Alpine defenses came to be known, was strong. But fortifications are only one part of a country's security. As French armed services enlistment hit an all-time low, no one seemed to be looking for other options. At this point, the, the French army, the, the military command, was run by old men who did not have a lot of new ideas. They didn't take into consideration things like the tank. They didn't really put a lot of money into experimenting with armored forces the way the Germans were. Um, they also didn't build up their air force. They didn't, they weren't, they, you know, these were new technologies that, um, that they really weren't interested in. I think it's fair to say that there was a mindset about not trying these new technologies, not trying to go on the offensive, and just making sure that France would not be attacked again. To ensure this, the French spread propaganda indicating the Maginot Line was much stronger than it was, that it could deflect any German attack, that it was invincible. One of the myths that uh, was quite prevalent, particularly in the early days, was that the Maginot Line is connected entirely together underground by this massive underground rail network. There were some really fantastic stories that appeared in some of the British newspapers and some illustrations that bore absolutely no relation to reality. Unfortunately, the propaganda worked better to fool the French into thinking the Maginot Line was unbreachable than it did to convince the Germans that it was. Good propaganda is propaganda that people actually want to believe, and if you tell it to them often enough, they will end up believing it. Uh, that was part of the reason for the defeatism uh, which was rampant in French society uh, in the 1930s, and which indirectly led to a sapping of military morale. Newsreel footage praising the strength of the line also did a better job of lulling the French into a false sense of security than scaring the Germans away from an attack. Though not fooled by the propaganda, the Germans knew the line was a formidable defense. They decided upon a plan to neutralize the Maginot Line, even as they began gobbling up their neighbors. In 1939, the border between France and Germany was a taut line, stretched across Europe. Hitler at first tested the waters of world opinion when he reoccupied the Rhineland. And thanks to a policy of appeasement, particularly from England, he found the waters warm. As the decade drew to a close, so did any chance for peace. Hitler's primary purpose in the 30s was to reverse the Versailles Treaty, step by step territory by territory. And after he had strengthened Germany in that way, he was going to launch his attack on the east. His argument again that he's just trying to um, reunite German-speaking peoples with Germany, uh, and this of course uh, leads to the, the very famous Munich conference with Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, claiming we have peace in our time, uh, and that Hitler is done. He just wanted to get all German-speaking peoples together, and, and now he will be satisfied. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. And then Hitler turns around in 1939 and, and invades Poland. 
With this invasion, England and France finally declared war on Germany on September 3, 1939. Britain went to war against Germany today. 25 years and 30 days from the time she entered the war of 1914 against the same enemy. France is expected to follow suit within the next few hours. The Maginot Line was put on full alert and troops were deployed along its entire length. In fact, France invaded Germany first. Although it made limited excursions just over the German border, no serious offensive effort was ever considered. The most uh, they ever did was send maybe a herd of sheep across the frontier to see where the landmines were. And so nothing happened, no shooting. And so rather than it being called the Blitzkrieg, it was called the Sitzkrieg, meaning the sitting war, or in English we called it the phony war. This was fine with the French, who had no choice now but to put their faith in the Maginot Line. In the northeast, the Maginot Line proper bristled with strong defenses. In the high Alps, forts kept watch along the border with Italy. The French anticipated deploying the bulk of their troops along the border between Belgium and France. The only gap in the defenses was in the heavily wooded area known as the Ardennes Forest. The French believed that no modern army could invade through the Ardennes, so they didn't worry very much about defending it. But the Germans realized the Maginot Line was a formidable defense best avoided. And they did. The Ardennes Forest would be no barrier to the modern German Blitzkrieg assault. The Maginot Line forced the enemy to attack France's weakest point. And this proved fatal for France as the Germans pushed through, using tanks and airplanes in ways the French hadn't anticipated. They went through that area and wrapped up the French and uh, British armies and the Belgian armies and the Dutch armies. Uh, and then they prepared to swing down into France. And what they did was a great turning movement starting along the coast and swinging around and then coming around in to attack the Maginot Line from the rear. For the most part, when the Germans did attack the Maginot Line, they were unsuccessful. With the combat blocks standing up well to bombardment by the heaviest artillery the Germans could bring into play. But there were exceptions. The Petit du Vrage of La Ferté at the far western end of the Maginot Line extension did fall to the Germans. The Germans were able to take that position because the Maginot extension had never been designed like the rest of the Maginot line proper. They'd done too much economizing and the Ouvrages could not give the same kind of support they could in the Maginot line proper because of the distance between them. The Germans marched into Paris on June 14, 1940 and seized the heart of France without ever breaking through the Maginot line. The southern forces were in disarray chaos reigned and the the French high command surrendered this is William L Shirer speaking from the forest of Compiègne where Adolf Hitler today is handing his armistice terms to France it is 3 15 p.m. Adolf Hitler strides slowly toward the little clearing I can see his face this grave solemn yet brimming with revenge Within weeks of the German invasion, France was defeated. Hitler was in Paris. The bulk of the troops along much of the Maginot Line hardly heard a gun fire. Word came down that France had capitulated. Undefeated, the troops surrendered the Maginot Line only to become prisoners of war. Soon, the Maginot Line became a storage depot for German military equipment. The world was stunned at how quickly France collapsed under the German juggernaut. Built into much of the criticism is the expectation that the French were in a position single-handedly 
to have forestalled the Germans and prevented the Second World War. And I think that is a gross distortion of what France's position was, what its capabilities were. Ironically, the Maginot Line sometimes takes heavier flak today than it ever got from Germany during the war. No matter how wonderful a bulwark you built, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do is to keep the enemy out, then it's in the wrong place or it's the wrong bulwark. Clausewitz, the great 19th century German theorist of war, said, if you entrench yourself behind strong fortifications, you compel the enemy to seek a solution elsewhere. And that, of course, is just what the Wiley Hun did. Others disagree. The Maginot Line was going to serve as a shield as it was intended for. That's what they wanted. That's what they got. That's what it did. The Maginot Line protected the border with Germany. I wouldn't say the line was a, a failure so much as the whole French military operation in 1940 was a failure. And I think that's where the emphasis would fall. Though the Maginot Line was the most technologically sophisticated fortification built, ever advancing technology ultimately defeated it. Fortifications like the Maginot Line are, are obsolete because of the air power. Um, that once you can fly over them uh, easily, and uh, you know, they're not they're not going to be able to stop uh, any high flying uh, airplanes carrying whatever bombs it may be. Certainly after World War II, nuclear bombs. How do you how would the Maginot Line possibly um, deflect a, a nuclear attack? It can't. In the long run. That may be one of the biggest failures in the Maginot Line. It may have engendered this false sense of security uh, on the part of the French that perhaps they would have been better off to take the money they had spent on the Maginot Line and to spend that money on improving their army, improving their training. By the close of World War II, the age of the fortified defensive barrier had ended. In the nuclear age, no serious attempt has been made to build a fortress around a country. And so the Maginot Line still wanders helter-skelter through the eastern fields of France, invaded only by tourists. Technological high point and low point all at once. Any fortification can be taken if the enemy is willing and able to pay the cost. The objective of fortification is to increase that cost to the level that the enemy is unable to pay. And that's what the French were trying to do with the Maginot Line, to build a strong fortification that would discourage the Germans from attacking and making it hard for them to attack. Hidden among the groves and hillsides of eastern France lies what remains of the greatest defensive barrier constructed since the Great Wall of China. Built by the French between the First and Second World Wars, the Maginot Line fulfilled the goals of its creators, and yet the French suffered a crushing defeat within weeks of open conflict with their enemies, the Germans. The line survives largely in ruins, and yet it barely saw any direct assault on its defenses. For over half a century, historians have debated, was the Maginot Line a horrendous failure or a thorough success? Today, the line has drifted into oblivion, called by some the greatest white elephant of the century, converted into a mushroom farm here or a museum there. Almost everything uh, has been broken or stolen, so very few are still in a good state of conservation. This is the case of uh, Imerov, uh, where uh, almost all the equipments are in working order. Some uh, were bought by uh, communities, like this one, well, to, to open it to public. Some were sold to uh, individual people, and uh, they just sold all the steel. This is a far cry from the line's purpose, conceived as a direct response to the devastation wreaked upon France at the close of the First World War. It became equal parts technology, desperation, and myth. But it began as a limited series of defensive fortifications in Alsace-Lorraine, near the German border, built to forestall a German invasion. It soon grew, at least in the minds of some, into an impregnable barrier over 500 miles long, extending from one end of France to the other. The Maginot Line consisted of reinforced subterranean concrete fortifications 
linked by firepower with large underground galleries, some containing railroads that carried ammunition and troops, plus sophisticated powerful weapons and communication centers, all designed to conserve manpower and keep Germany out of France. The Maginot Line was born out of the horrors of World War I, a war that was supposed to end all wars. World War I was different than any war in history. It was a war characterized by technology and a war that was fought on several dimensions. It was fought in the air, under the sea, on the land, and under the land. And new weapons were developed and used, such as the tank. When Germany surrendered on November 11th, 1918, much of Europe was in tatters. But France had been the stage upon which most of the war had been played out. Its victory was one from which it barely recovered. At this point, we're tired. We are tired, tired, tired. And here we have a treaty that gives us a breathing space. There's no real immediate worry. The treaty was the Treaty of Versailles which attempted to settle the disagreements between the opposing sides of World War I and ensured that Germany could never again threaten its neighbors. Though the treaty was intended to resolve the First World War, some argue that it may have guaranteed a second. The Versailles Treaty was a disaster for Germany and turned out to be a disaster for everybody else. It hinged on Article 231 where Germany had to sign that it started the war and was responsible for it and had to pay for all the damages. The monetary damages were 33 billion. In addition to the reparations Germany had to pay, it lost 15 percent of its land, including some to Poland and Belgium. It had to give up Alsace-Lorraine, captured from France in 1870. Germany's armed forces were partly dismantled and reduced to 100,000 men. The Rhineland, a springboard for previous German invasions of Western Europe, was occupied by the Allies and was to be demilitarized. Germany had a Versailles complex. If anything united Germany, from the communists to the extreme right and the monarchists, it was that Versailles was unfair. And Hitler could rise on this Versailles complex. His message was, I will lead you out of Versailles. I will lead you out of the shame of Versailles. I think the Treaty of Versailles has been made a scapegoat. What would the Germans have done if they had won? After Woodrow Wilson helped draft the treaty, the United States Congress hedged. The U.S. didn't ratify the Versailles Treaty. They didn't give the guarantee of the Rhineland Agreement that, that Wilson had promised so that the French certainly had reason to feel let down on that score. In 1918, the British had sounded as strenuous as the French about reparations, about getting the Germans to pay, about being solid with their former ally. Within the space of a year or so, the British changed their tune. They felt va vastly disappointed that the British could not see that the French had real security problems. With the Channel and the Atlantic between them, France began to feel abandoned by its allies, and a sense of dread tinged their exhaustion. The problem that France has always had is that it is believed in its own intrinsic glory, thinking back to the days of Louis XIV and, and Napoleon. But if a nation does not have the morale and the will to defend itself, then you can't blame the Allies. Demographics played a huge role in, in uh, subsequent French defense preparations. Uh, the French realized they didn't have the manpower to actually launch offensives against Germany. So there's this sort of this, this psychological mood in France um, that even though f the French were the victors, they don't feel like the victors. With their alliances faltering, France was no longer the world power it had been. And there was a decidedly pacifist attitude throughout the country in response to the devastation it had suffered. Yet France recognized the very real threat a vengeful Germany might pose, 
Whatever solution France came up with, it had to involve more than just soldiers. For France in the 1920s, the first step in any attempt to thwart a possible resurgent Germany was to defend those areas most vulnerable to attack. The Alsace and Lorraine regions in northeastern France near the Rhineland were the most obvious choice, with compulsory military service in France now shrunk to one year, plus the loss of men from the recent war. Permanent battalions of soldiers did not exist to stand guard. The French contemplated a barrier of some kind. Throughout the countryside, medieval towns and villages are surrounded by walls designed to keep attackers out and villagers safely in. But fortifications have their drawbacks too. One of the problems with any sort of extensive system of fortifications is you have to defend them all and you have to defend them all equally. Otherwise your attacker is going to go through your weak spots. So this means you have to spread out your defenders. And this gives somewhat of an advantage to the attacker because it allows the attacker to uh, attack you, concentrate his strength while you have your strength spread out. France also looked to the harsh lessons of the Great War when it had become apparent that a swift victory after a few limited battles would not be forthcoming. <laughs> 